girls, I'm your moderator for t uh, this afternoon. Uh, my name is Jade F. Lee, um, and I'm joined here by four cartoonists and to talk about a topic that's very near and dear to our hearts. So uh, we're going to introduce um, ourselves, and we're just going to go down the line. Um, Shauna, if you want to go first. Hi, everyone. My name is Shauna J. Grant, and I draw Princess Love Pond. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi guys, my name is Wendy Shu. Um, I draw mooncakes and pigeon boyfriend. <laughs> she has a beautiful pigeon boyfriend tote bag you all should check out. Uh, hi everybody, I'm Carrie Peach. Um, I'm working on Lumber Jeans, Mages of Mistralia, um, and I make comics about magic and empathy like Lost Haven. Hi everyone, um, my name is Veronica Agarwal and I draw a webcomic called Magical Girl Problems, Magical Girl Solutions. Well, thanks everyone, uh, and I'm your moderator, uh, that's me. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I draw food comics and that sometimes involve magic. Uh, my site can be found at dumplingheart.com. Um, so here's how we're going to do this. Uh, we're going to start with a brief overview of Magical Girl history. Then we're going to go into talking about the panelists' individual works. Um, I will lead the discussion with some questions, and at some point I'm going to ask the audience uh, to prepare for audience questions at the end um, before I'm done by lining up near the microphone. Um, originally I was planning on index cards, but unfortunately I forgot them. So uh, <laughs> we'll do this the other way. Okay, so during the segment, I'm going to try to run through this very quickly so that we can talk about our panelists' great works. Um, so panelists, if at any point during this uh, history lesson you want to chime in, please do so. Uh, okay, so first off, magical girls, what do we mean by that? Um, they're girls that are magical. <laughs> um, so, uh, the Maho Shoujo genre is a subgenre that started in uh, Japanese manga and anime, um, and they usually feature young girls as the heroes of uh, their story. And uh, common themes involve uh, transformation, coming of age, and uh, friendship, particularly amongst girls. So this pictured here is Osama Tezuka's Princess Knight, which was published in 1953 and is considered the prototype of magical girl genre. Uh, in the 60s, uh, magical girls uh, gained prominence with Sally the Witch, which was an uh, anime adapted from its manga, the first of its kind, and uh, was inspired by Mary Poppins and Bewitched, the American sitcom. During this era, it was mostly dudes creating magical girl stories for the demographic of young girls. And from the 70s to 80s, still mostly dudes creating uh, <laughs> these stories. Uh, but as the socio-political climate for women in Japan changed, so too did the stories about magical girls. Uh, in the 70s, Cutie Honey was considered revolutionary for having a female protagonist for shonen manga, which is manga for young boys. Uh, but her main thing was that she was partially nude during her transformation. So that gives you an indicator of what people thought young boys were into in the 70s. Um, but then as we get closer to the 90s, throughout the 80s, we have more stories about young girls transforming into older versions of themselves and finding their own success and uh, inner strength. And then we reach, whoa, the 90s. <laughs> so I believe, um, panelists correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe most of us grew up during this boom <laughs> of um, magical yeah. girl anime. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, for many of us, Sailor Moon and Cockcaptor Sokra were kind of the gateways for our entry into comics in general. And I will let the panelists talk about that uh, themselves in more detail. Uh, later, but during this time you had female creators, uh, magic girl teams, and uh, genres that span sci-fi and uh, fantasy and gained international popularity. And queer themes, wow, and genre subversions, mm -hmm. and even um, female creators who cre introduced magical boys in the 2000s. So uh, I believe Veronica, you told me that your uh, first uh, magic girl um, stories that you really caught on to were actually in the early 2000s. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so 
Princess Tutu is actually one of my favorites. So 2000s kind of continued that 90s trend. And then we get to our current decade and we have, <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> and now we have dark and gritty deconstructions because every genre apparently needs that. <laughs> um, and remakes of popular 90s properties. So as kind of like I feel like magical girl genre has waned a bit in uh, Japan, um, those of us who grew up in the 90s with uh, magical girls as our inspiration are now creating medium. And it's got this kind of like international blossoming now. And the fact that all of us up here create magical girl uh, stories is a testament to that. So I wanted to discuss first off, what is it about magical girls that we like? Panelists. Um, well, I like magical girl stories because, as you saw here in the history, there's like such a variety. It can be dark, it could be light and fluffy. So there's always something that might tick your box, and it's just fun seeing a story that stars like a female character and. You know, they're treated like with respect and going on through their lives. And it's just really, really cute stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, I really like magical girls, especially like witches, because they can fight back and they take no crap from anyone. <laughs> 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 um, because I think a lot of times, like as women, um, we can feel very powerless. And in these narratives, we can kind of reclaim like, like our power because like you can, you know, text someone. <laughs> <laughs> I am with both Wendy and Shauna on this one. I think there's something obviously really powerful about um, kind of the powerful about, about a power fantasy for, for women. And I also love that Magical Girl genre celebrates um, kind of traditionally femme qualities and things that society kind of assigns to women's gender role. Um, so things like developing your friendships, like empathetic work, emotional work, and emotional labor that's kind of traditionally been handed to women is lifted up as this isn't just something you have to do to get on with your battles. This is an important part of your lives, and it's a way that you can address your, um, address your conflicts, not just with swords. So swords are pretty cool, too. So I'm into the fact that you kind of have both options in magical yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I think like a lot of you know, like Jade said, a lot of the magical girl genre talks about like young girls who are kind of given the chance to, you know, live their lives as like the older versions of themselves and kind of find themselves through that. And definitely, you know, what Carrie said, like learning to celebrate a lot of, you know, the girliness right. that I think a lot of young girls can be, you know, teased for liking girly right. things. I think when I was younger, definitely I was kind of like, shied away from more girly things and tried to expand in a different direction to kind of avoid that. But I think also celebrating that and making it known that like it's okay to like that kind of thing and celebrating it through those stories is really important. Yeah. I think um, oftentimes growing up as uh, young girls, it's this really confusing uh, message that we get mm -hmm. from a lot of uh, all pressures around us where on the one hand we're expected to be feminine, to be girly, but that's also seen as bad in a lot of ways. Like, oh, that's, you throw like a girl. Like, oh, you're into that girly crap, I think. Um, I think especially if you're into comics at a young age, that's something that mm -hmm. is often framed as a traditionally male space. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's uh, it, that's kind of a double combo of right. you're much more likely to suffer from that kind of internalized misogyny of like, I like this thing, but is that okay? Is that something that society values for people right. like me? Especially seeing, you know, people who say, like you said, like, oh, you throw like a girl, you know, it's for boys, it's really bad for them to like girly mm -hmm. things. Right. And then, you know, as a girl seeing that, you're kind of like, oh, like maybe, maybe girly things are a bad thing and mm -hmm. I'm less for liking that or less for, you know, indulging in that. You kind of want to separate yourself from something that makes you, you know, like more feminine. Mm -hmm. Um, I was never like shamed for you know enjoying comics because the only co the first comics that I ever got into were like Car Captor Sakura, yeah. like Sailor Same. Moon, mm -hmm. and um, I didn't get into superheroes until like much later in life. Mm -hmm. So I think that kind of paved the way for me to want to to do comics. Yeah. I think it was really difficult uh, for me, speaking personally, to get into superhero comics mm -hmm. at a younger age because I was raised on things like Sar Car Captor Sakura and Sailor Moon where I saw a lot of uh, different 
all female characters, and in superheroes, it's like the one girl on the team mm-hmm. or something, whose main thing is she's the girl. <laughs> like, so, <laughs> right, you have the strong one, the brave yeah. one, like the sassy one, the and one the girl, the cook, yeah. and then the one, the girl. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Well, so what was your the first magical girl story? Maybe uh, a film, anime, or series, or a manga that really kind of like latched onto uh, your memory and influenced your work, Shana? Um, well, for me, my first magical girl story was Sailor Moon. And I remember I was six years old and I was in the hospital and the nurses would wake me up at like 6 a.m. in the morning and I would stay awake because Sailor Moon was on the TV. Oh, and <laughs> I was like, what is this? That was like my first anime, like my first anything. And, like, from that moment, I was just in love with it. Like, after school with my friend, our thing was watching Sailor Moon together and seeing, like, oh, man, what's going to happen between Sailor Moon and Tuxedo Mask and (laughs) all that stuff. And it's just, I just loved it so much. And growing up, I just wanted to eat up, like, everything, like, Magic Girl. Um, it was so funny. When I was growing up, I also watched Sailor Moon, like, early in the morning before school. But I remember, like, playing with my friends on the playground, and I didn't actually have a lot of girlfriends, but um, I had, like, these two guy friends. And I'd be like, one of you has to be Tuxedo Mask, and you have to die. <laughs> like, uh, I'd be like, you, you pretend to die, and I will save you. <laughs> yeah, and then... Um, and then a few years later, when I was like nine or ten, I started watching Car Captor Sakura mm-hmm. and Kiki's Delivery Service, and those were all super formative for me. Um, buck in the trend, my first magical girl story was also Sailor Moon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't watch a lot of TV growing up, but I had a cool babysitter who was in high school, and she was fantastic and brought my brother and me. Um, VHS, like, taped directly off the TV, terrible tapes of the dub of Sailor Moon, and it changed my life. I was very grateful to it, I think, uh, because a lot of the stories I was into in, like, fantasy and science fiction at the time, um, I didn't see a lot of, we were all talking about before, things that celebrated, um, like, the girly parts of my life, so it was really wonderful to see, uh, you know, she's so into makeup and her friends and spending time with them and solving these emotional problems that everyone's struggling with, and that meant a lot to me. Also, um, the theme song was great. <laughs> yeah. it was very good. Right. Uh, when I was younger, I was really into um, Tokyo Mew Mew. Uh, the actual, the first one I picked up was Tokyo Mew Mew a la mode, which is actually like the spin-off that had two volumes featuring like, I don't even remember her name, which hurts me a little bit, I should. Um, was it Ichigo? Like, I think, wasn't it Ichigo? Isn't yeah. the main character Ichigo? It was the one who was the bunny. Oh, okay. I don't she had, she I'll had be honest, funny I have ears not and seen a cat Tokyo tail. Yet, so. um, <laughs> but I got into that one, and then from there, I read the original. Um, and I just I enjoyed like how fun it was. You know, each of these girls, like the stories, each of them kind of bond with this animal and then get like powers of that animal. And I just like I just love seeing like like the powers that they had and like the way that their outfits changed based on like which animal they were bonded with. Um, and yeah, I just really enjoyed like. The, the art style I was like sucked into it <laughs> so when did you watch Sailor Moon honestly <laughs> like all I feel like all of you are gonna <laughs> find me like within like the last few years because oh. when I was younger I was really into Tokyo Mew Mew and I just never picked up on Sailor Moon it never was like I always knew about it but it was mm-hmm. never something that like I got into and then more recently I decided to pick it up and I like I did fall in love with it I still have I was watching um the new release of the dub on Hulu. Mm-hmm. So, like, I was watching the original and also the new one just to get a feel for how they both okay. were. Yeah. Um, and the newer dub was released much slower, so I was, like, waiting for each new episode. Yeah. Oh, I would, I would be so curious to hear... I thought you were going to say that you watched the re- remake Crystal first. No, 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 okay. no. I saw... I mean, like, I don't want to, like, be mean about it, but I just... I had seen pictures, and I just love the original style and, like, the fluidity yeah. mm-hmm. of, like, the poses and the facial expressions appealed so much more to me. Mm-hmm. And, like, I guess it has more of like a nostalgic feel yeah. to the art style and the coloring. And the um, outfits. Yeah, that yeah. I just <laughs> love so much about it. And I really wanted to like, if I'm going to watch this for the first time, I want to capture that feeling cool. first rather than watching like an updated version. 
All right. Well, I will have um, a few more all panelists general questions near the end of this panel. But first, I would like to actually get into our panelists' works. So Shauna, let's begin with you. You draw uh, and write Princess Love Pond, which is a webcomic about a high schooler who happens to end up becoming a magical girl after a bunny thing falls on her face. <laughs> um, so the first thing I, I mean, I read through this in one sitting and then I read it again oh. and then told all my friends to read it because it is the cutest thing I have ever laid eyes on. So, and you know, the thing is that like, oh, it's so cute, I wanna squish her face, but it's also really kind of as, I guess, like, you know, uh, optimistic as it is. I also feel like, oh, it's really like it touches on a lot of things that young girls uh, kind of like deal with uh, in high school. So my question to you is, how does this unrepentant cuteness <laughs> empower your character and perhaps readers? Um, well, like we were talking about earlier and how girly things were kind of like bash when we were younger. I wanted to write a story that showed that there are other ways to be strong. So like, you can go ahead and like, wield a sword and have armor, but like, you know, you can have a petticoat and mm -hmm. a kiss would be just fine too, because you know, that's what's really great about magical girls. It can go in like all different sorts of directions. So like, um, I also, like besides just loving drawing cute things, felt it was really important to write a story about a black girl that was just utterly cute and the star of her own story because I feel like that's not something you normally see in media. Yeah, so um, how much of your own experiences are represented in your characters? Uh, like going, looking back at my pages and going through my ideas and everything, I'm just kind of like, oh yeah, a lot of this is kind of like in me. Um, a lot of the characters like experience things that like I went through, like wanting to be loved or feeling left behind. You know, that stuff that I went through growing up and going through like my love life and dealing with my friendships. And you know, I feel like everybody you know has gone through that. So. It was really easy for me to write that, and I'm glad that it's been relatable so far. Right. Um, yeah, I think like you mentioned earlier how like, um, yeah, we really don't see a lot of particularly young black women represented in media, or at least in a way that's not dismissive mm -hmm. um, or crude. Um, and I think that like what's so refreshing about your uh, story is that she is so cute and she is so happy, and like she's not burdened by um, the these narratives that we usually see um, young black yeah. women burdened with in the media. So how important is it for you to represent this sort of story for uh, young girls of color? Um, it's really very important. I remember growing up and I was always hungry to like see myself and like everything I enjoyed. So there really wasn't a lot of that. And if there was a black female character, Chances are she's not like the really cute pink one. Like, <laughs> yeah. I remember when I was young, like I always wanted to be like the pink Power Ranger. You know, that was, that was just me. Yeah. And like, this really affected me and I didn't realize how much it affected me until I was in college doing comics and I got to a point where I was like, wow, I actually don't draw characters that look like me. Mm. It wasn't until like junior year that I actually went out of my way to draw black characters and so I wanted to make stories and characters that a young me would want to read. Right. Um, have you gotten any, what was the most rewarding <laughs> feedback that you got uh, for Princess Love Pond? Um, well so far like the most rewarding is just everybody that kind of finds me at conventions and stuff and they're just like thank you so much for making this. Like, I just started Princess Love Pond like a little over a year ago, so I didn't really expect it to kind of blow up the way that it did. So when people are just like, thank you, and like some are like 
in tears in front of me oh, just like so happy so to see themselves like in something that's really cute and happy or like they're just like oh my god this is like perfect for my friend because there's nothing out there for my friend so I'm just really really touched when this happens I'm just so glad like people have taken to it yeah I mean I love it a lot so <laughs> please check out Princess Love Pond it's a webcomic so, okay, let's uh, jump over to Veronica and talk about magical girl problems and mag Oh, wait, is it hashtag magical girl problems, magical girl solutions, or is it just magical girl problems, magical girl solutions? Either is fine. Okay. Either works. Um, yeah, so uh, so this is more kind of, it's also a webcomic. Uh, magical girl problems, magical girl solutions is a, um, is a gag a day fair to say type of thing, like uh, four coma strip. Um, yeah based uh, type work and it usually has a humorous punchline but some of it gets kind of real too <laughs> um, and I often kind of, oftentimes kind of like read um, this comic and think wow this is like really you know a lot of our kind of uh, magic girl stories came from the 90s and it kind of shows its age sometimes but this is very much present now hashtags and Twitters and whatnot so um, does the social media culture affect the way that you write these uh, snippets? Yeah, I'm definitely, um, I really wanted to do a magic girl story that like, you know, referenced what girls are going through now, you know, female creators, what they go through online, what they face online. Um, and a lot of girls who are growing up today who, you know, love going on social media, they love, mm -hmm. you know, they love using hashtags, they love posting stuff on Instagram. Um, I have a younger cousin who, um, she's only about four years younger than me, but she, you know, she loves posting pictures on Instagram mm -hmm. and she loves photography. And I feel like, and my, I have two older uh, guy cousins who, you know, will tease her and be like, oh, like you're posting pictures of your food on Instagram and all that. And I just, I feel like that's a little unfair. Mm -hmm. I always feel like that's so unfair to kind of, you know, pick on that and draw on that. I feel like things that girls like, people and, you know, society will always find something to like nitpick about it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I really wanted to make this story for girls and be like, you know, it's okay and don't be ashamed of, you know, tweeting about stuff and like enjoying things that you like and following celebrities on Twitter and getting excited when they, you know, reply to you and, you know, enjoying social media because it's supposed to be enjoyed. That's what it's there for. But sometimes I feel like a lot of people feel like they, they shouldn't talk about it mm -hmm. in person or like enjoy it to the fullest. Um, so I wanted Magical Girl Problems, Magical Girl Solutions to really represent that. Right. Yeah, and like, if you guys can see this uh, panel that I have, or this uh, strip that I have included, um, is a Magical Girl suffering from uh, menstrual cramps while she has to be on the job, and this monster, this chauvinistic monster is like, it can't be that bad. And I thought this was hilarious because, yeah, we well, drew it as a, like, this uh, purple monster, but hey, that happens in real life, and you know, who doesn't wish to be a magical girl and set some of these like chauvinists <laughs> straight? Um, so, and also an interesting thing is that I do notice that your magical girl designs have a superhero-y, um, that's, that's a really scientific word, superhero-y, <laughs> um, super <laughs> heroic uh, design to them. So can you talk a little bit about um, if there is a difference between magical girls and superheroes, uh, where the lines blur between that and what, where do they intersect? Um, well, in my comic, I really, I do want to touch upon in the future, you know, how superheroes, you know, male superheroes would be perceived, you know, within this universe and how magical girls, you know, would be perceived and the differences, you know, um, and what, what society would say about them, I think, if they were both coexisted in the same world. And a lot of, I think a lot of the um, outfit designs, I really was thinking, you know, like, what's, like, what's realistic, what's, um, I forget the word that I'm looking for, but what's like, what would be a good fighting outfit? Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of right. magical Practical. girls have super short, sh super short skirts, you know, a lot of frills and all that stuff. Um, and that stuff is a lot of fun, but then there's, I'm sure there are also girls who'd be like, I wouldn't be comfortable wearing that to right. battle. I would prefer something that makes me feel comfortable mm -hmm. rather than something that makes me feel pretty. Yeah. Um, 
It's an interesting so design conundrum yeah. uh, because, you know, on the one hand, it's a fantasy. We want it to look appealing and, you know, in a fantasy, we can explore things that are not practical. But at the same time, too, it's like when do readers start thinking, oh, that's what all women should wear. They all wear heels and it's fine. <laughs> what do you mean your feet hurt and your toes are bleeding, <laughs> right? So I think about a lot like, you know, if I wanted to, if I was going to fight crime, I would want to wear an outfit that would make me feel happy. And my personal tastes are not, you know, I don't wear like Lolita and frills, like personally. Mm -hmm. And I would love to do a magical girl that did wear that, but like a lot of these are based off of me and my friends. So I draw off of, you know, what they wear and what makes them comfortable and what they would enjoy um, fighting crime in. So less people think that your comic's all about magical girls complaining. The other side of it is magical girl solutions, which I also find very comical. So if we had girls with magic who fight crime, would we have more problems or solutions? Um, I think, you know, like this is something I touch upon in the comic too, I think like it would solve a lot of pre-existing problems but also create a whole mess of new ones. You know, there are things that, you know, like you said, like being able to kick a chauvinistic monster in the face, um, but then, you know, it would create issues where people make assumptions about you or people, you know, think that you're like a, maybe a fake hero because you're just a girl and all these other things. So I think like while it would solve maybe problems you feel like, oh, like if I was magical, I would solve all of my problems, but it would also create a lot of new ones. I think putting magical girls in this like realistic light makes them a lot more accessible mm -hmm. to young girls who might be reading it. So that's like where I wanted to aim the strips. Yeah. I mean, personally, I wish I had magic to uh, make my hair behave. Um, <laughs> I definitely, I looked up like how much it costs for a female haircut the other day, and I had a heart attack. <laughs> yeah. Alrighty, so let's move on to Wendy. Thank you for being very patient with me, panelists. I know that, um, you know, we're getting into it. <laughs> no, of course. But, yeah. yeah. So Wendy, you draw um, and write. Wait, no, you draw. I co-create. You co-create. Okay. Um, can you talk a little? Oh, mooncakes. Uh, also a webcomic, and um, can you talk a little bit about your collaborative process because you do have a writer um, credited on your work, right? Oh, yeah, right. yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> Suzanne, Suzanne Walker is um, one of my really good friends. She's an amazing writer, um, and she writes the script for Mooncakes, um, but we have a lot of, like, back and forth on the, uh, the creation of the script. I mean, I let her do whatever she wants because Frankly, I'm like too lazy to write. <laughs> I would just rather draw it. Um, but she gives me like a lot of leeway, like as mm -hmm. to which panels, you know, how to panel it. Like um, as long as I have like the dialogue on there, and sometimes like I edit the dialogue myself, and that's fine with her. Um, but yeah, it's it's been like I wanted like Asian American characters, and then she wanted, and like we both wanted queer characters, and then she wanted. Um, like she wanted one of the characters to be hard of hearing because uh, it's mm -hmm. not something that gets a lot of representation. So that's kind of like, so we have these characters that are kind of at the intersection of a bunch of identities, but the comic is not like about that. <laughs> right. Um, actually, it's interesting because uh, you do bill it as a queer Chinese American paranormal romance. Um, and so it hits a lot of marks and you know, these are very important representations of uh, people who are usually not um, represented in media. But when I was reading this, I was just struck by how um, peaceful and like just focused on everyday life the story was. So um, yeah, there's magic and there's uh, an arch demon in the forest. But some of my favorite moments of your comic were just kind of like, yeah, eat, uh, making breakfast and eating breakfast with the, uh, the, the nanas. Um, so those are some of my favorite moments in it. And uh, so can you talk a little bit about uh, why this focus on kind of the seemingly mundane and what that means? Oh, um, I love like how Miyazaki's work so much. Um, like all of Studio Ghibli's work from like their slice of life stuff, like Whisper of the Heart and Only Yesterday to like the fantastical, you know, Howl's Moving Castle, Kiki's Delivery Service. But even in the fantastical world, um, in Ghibli films, there's so much emphasis on the everyday, like Sophie, you know, cleaning out the castle, or like Kiki, like making a delivery, just like, you know, living her life, like making dinner for herself. And I think, 
like like that's those are the things that I enjoy like I enjoy thinking about like what would happen if you were a witch but also like made breakfast like just did <laughs> just do something I mean I'm sure there's like you know lots of problems as as there are in the comic um with being like a magical person mm -hmm. but they're just like you know regular people too and I think emphasizing the small moments in life like really really humanize the characters and um, like especially in you know Miyazaki films you see characters the way that characters do their daily tasks just tells you so much about them mm -hmm. you know how how thorough Sophie is how kind of like aggressive Kiki gets when she's like angry and she's like trying to make her pancakes <laughs> um, and like and I'm more I'm interested in kind of figuring out character through the little things they do not not the big things they do yeah that's really revealing and like so I am a um a sucker for like badass grandmas in um in yeah. stories and I love the nanas so much because they just have this like razor sharp sense of humor and um but they're also so warm and like you know will make you breakfast and be like yeah of course you can stay over you look really beat up and you were like living in the forest for a little bit or something <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah we still love you uh, but we can kill you so, <laughs> um yeah so like i don't know for, those are some of my favorite characters and i was actually very like appreciative of how um so when i first um saw the cover, I'm like, oh, it's going to be a cute romance between these two young um, teens. Uh, but then I also was uh, warmly uh, surprised by uh, the Nana's relationship. So how uh, important was it for you to show an elderly couple, um, particularly an Asian American elderly couple, as, um, who are queer? I think that like a lot of times like older women get dismissed so much. But, like, in Chinese culture, like, the auntie is queen, <laughs> um, and so is grandma. <laughs> so, um, like, y you know, it's also, like, in queer communities, um, a lot of emphasis, like, rightfully so, is on the youth. But there's also, like, so much to be said for the elderly people who exist there. Um, and so, like... I, don't, I just wanted, like, we both, me and Suzanne both wanted kind of this, like, happy, happy couple who who are also, like, you know, take no crap from anyone, um, <laughs> who kind of, like, if you look on the website um, under, like, the bio about the characters section, you know, they kind of met later in life. This wasn't, like, their big, great romance, but it was just kind of like a, a oh. thing that happened. Yeah. yeah. So is there going to be a spin-off of the Bananas? <laughs> yeah. Like maybe, maybe someday. <laughs> like, Talk to me yeah. when I finish the comic first. <laughs> <laughs> so before we move on to the next panelist, I have this like burning question and curiosity. What is wrong with horses? Oh. Why, well, like, because there, throughout the comic, um, there is an archdemon horse uh, and both separate characters have, on different occasions, <laughs> said uh, expletive horses. Um, so I don't like horses. They're, <laughs> <laughs> they're so I, bad to they're, draw. They're, they're, I, they're, I too, just... they're too big, and they don't, they don't <laughs> care about anyone. <laughs> 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 they, they just they eat the ground, and then they could kill you. And they just, like, <laughs> I had a friend who... I had a friend who was a, a vet, um, and she said that they were the worst animal to work with. <laughs> I, I think you just broke a lot of young girls' I'm hearts. Sorry. Where like horses. I'm, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm really glad you like them, but I don't like them. <laughs> That's okay. We can have different opinions. <laughs> all right. <laughs> like, now we so now we all know Wendy Shu's opinion <laughs> of that. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> well, you know, American a, magical girls turned into a debate about horses. <laughs> welcome to horse. Yeah, welcome. Well, <laughs> it's okay, you know. I that's okay. It's okay if I don't like them. It's okay that you like them, you know. This is a very important lesson. People can like yes. different things. Yes. Yay. <laughs> and still like each other. Alrighty. But <laughs> <laughs> But thank you. <laughs> 
Oh, all right. So when, uh, sorry, like, oh, Wendy, which is, yeah. Like, oh, Carrie. <laughs> all right, so Carrie, uh, you have done a lot of work with uh, depicting witches in ver a variety of mini comics. Um, I've read a fair amount of them. And one thing that struck me about your comics is that uh, similarly to the little things depicted in Wendy's comic, your witches also have a tendency to be focused on um, different crafts mm -hmm. and different maybe domestic um, skills. What life skills do you most associate with um, magical girls or witchness? Mm -hmm. I think uh, witchcraft is a telling word to me or that says a lot about um, the way the witches that I'm interested in writing about are kind of using the analogy of these careful learned skills that are sometimes undervalued um, as a, a different kind of power. So there are all these hobbies and crafts that have kind of historically been viewed as like, oh, that's, that's women's work in a really dismissive way. So things like knitting, things like baking, things like pottery and cooking um, are incredibly valuable skills to have that society couldn't run without. Um, but historically have, like I said, been kind of dismissed as lesser. Um, so it's important to me to spend some time to focus on like, no, these, these can be sources of power for you if that's a thing that you're into also. Is there a parallel between uh, our work as cartoonists and artists and witchcraft, do you think? I, absolutely. That was such a, um, Jade sent us some questions ahead of time, which were really thoughtful. And that one made me stop and go back and reread a bunch of my own work with it in mind. Um, and I, I think, um, like with any discipline or craft, if it's something that you haven't spent the time to learn yourself, there's kind of a mystery in like, oh, what happens? Like, what happens behind the scenes? Like, in a pottery studio, what happens behind the scenes? Um, like if you're not making comics, you can s sometimes see someone appear with a finished comic and be like, that's magic. What, how yeah. did it happen? How did it all come together? Um, so I'm definitely interested in spending some time with the little details like Wendy talked about of domestic life and the small ways that we go about making these big projects happen. So your work also features a lot of uh, appearances by familiars. Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes in Magic Girl, uh, like kind of stories about witches, um, the power of a magical girl is represented or guided by mm -hmm. a magical creature of some sort. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about like uh, what you think of uh, familiars do in your work? Uh, what do they represent mm -hmm. for either the character or readers? I think the um, the companion animals that struck, stuck with me the most strongly from magical girl stories are probably um, from Sailor Moon and also from like Magic Knight Ray Earth, where often it's more of a mentor figure. It's, um, an animal kind of appears as a re representation of a young girl's power or to bring a power to her or to have a beautiful rabbit creature fall on her head. <laughs> Here you are, now this is yours. Um, so I, I love that, and I love that uh, you can draw on that kind of partnership to give you strength. Um, I'm also interested in familiar is as kind of uh, like a canary in a coal mine representation of power. So the way that daemons are talked about in Golden Compass almost is uh, a familiar can reflect like your own emotional state. It can be a shorthand for like, is my animal doing okay? Like, do I need to take better care of them and by extension of myself? Um, so they're both really interesting approaches. I think there's a lot to be explored there. Yeah. Um, an interesting thing is that uh, when we, magical girls are generally depicted as benevolent, mm -hmm. um, and it's drawn from kind of like the idea of the good witch. But um, it's interesting be to me because I recently watched a film called The Witch, and oh, it's definitely scary. where, yeah, The Witch, <laughs> it's, it's a very scary film, and uh, kind of like draws back to when witches were thought of as monsters, mm -hmm. as like kind of um, these things that people genuinely believed would, um, hurt them. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about um, how, you know, is it the influence of Miyazaki, like a Kiki's Delivery Service, or where does this kind of like um, influence of the good witch come from? And is that like, is good and evil even a good way to think about mm -hmm. witches? I think like with any kind of power, it's a choice about what you do with your magic. That's kind of a choice you have to make day to day. You're not a good person because you did a good thing one time. That's work that you have to continue to do throughout your life to make better decisions and learn more about your world. Um, I am definitely watched Kiki's at an early age and loved that portrayal of witches. Um, Ursula K. Le Guin's Earthsea books write a lot about um, 
kind of women's magic in a world where historically magic has been uh, the purview solely of of men, which is a little gender binary essentialist. But she has some really interesting points about um, kind of the way that witchcraft had to be this underground um, work for a long time because they weren't allowed into magical universities. Um, so I think that was really influential in the way that I think about witchcraft um, as a kind of way to push back against the dominant way that people learn and acquire power in a magical setting. Great. Okay, so at this time, I'm going to, so it says here that I have index cards. I do not have index cards because <laughs> I forgot. Um, so, but at this time, if audience, I'm going to ask the panelists some general questions. If audience members who want to ask questions would like to line up um, at the microphones on either side, um, please do so now, um, and we'll get to you momentarily. So, um, for this part, I want to kind of do some like kind of flash um, questions for everyone to go down the line. So, just kind of like you know, very general, fun questions. Um, all right, you guys ready? All right, yeah, all righty. Let's do it. Um, if you had a familiar, what would it be? <laughs> um, probably a bird. Ooh, okay. Maybe a pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> Some love for pigeons going around. Um, I already have a familiar, and it is my cat, and she is very angry all the time. <laughs> um, I would love for it to be a dragon, but realistically, it's probably like a St. Bernard, like something that tries really hard, but gets really tired and needs to go oh. lie down. <laughs> um, the first thing that popped in my head was a koala. Oh, I don't oh. like, they're just so cute. I love and they're koalas. Also, yeah. Like, yeah, I, I, break, yeah. I also hate to break it to you. They also eat their mom's poops. Oh, well, oh, I mean, sorry. so do the like, so do dogs. dogs yeah. eat their own poops. That's true. I think a lot That's of true. animals eat their own poops. <laughs> they're, they're still cute, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We can is, forgive a lot of them. <laughs> is there a genre trope that you actually hate? Um, I guess the whole identity thing. Like, oh, no, they can't know who I am. And I say this even though I play with it in my comic anyway, but. <laughs> well, the things that we hate, we don't generally try to like, oh, uh, I can make that better. <laughs> so, yeah. Wendy? I don't really like the idea of like having a one true love. Mm. I, th I think that's like, that's just cliched and boring. Mm -hmm. okay. I don't hate, I have a lot of affection for clumsy heroines, but I wish clumsiness, like sometimes that really hecks you up. It's not just a cute thing where you land in a puddle, like bones get broken. I've twisted some knees and hurt some folks by being a klutz, so <laughs> be real about clumsiness, it sucks. Um, I think definitely the practicality of costumes bothers me a lot, and I think about it a lot. And just in general, like in action movies, I think about like the damages. Um, and I think in Magical Girl, genres like there isn't these huge destructive mm -hmm. things but like I still think about that a, lo a lot mm -hmm. like collateral damage yeah right. mm -hmm. like especially if a monster like walks through a whole city and I'm like somebody somebody lived in that house yep. <laughs> oh my god <laughs> really? it's like somebody's raising was pooping in that yard. <laughs> <laughs> they're raising the insurance premium on the property <laughs> um so okay Drawing from my own personal experience, I knew that after being caught in Sailor Moon Fever, there were some, in, uh, looking back, somewhat embarrassing um, original character designs oh uh, of Sailor Scouts in my old sketchbooks. Are there any original Magical Girl characters from those days that you are gutsy enough to share with us? Um, okay, so my OC for Sailor Moon was Sailor Crystal Moon, so. <laughs> <laughs> Very original. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's the best, I'm sure. <laughs> I had this, I, I don't even remember her name, but like the first novel I started to write when I was 12 had this girl at the center of like an epic magical destiny. Like she goes to this promised land or this like, you I know, other it. world. <laughs> like, Sounds good. Yeah. She was I wish I had the original like evidence. <laughs> uh, um, I made a whole stable, pun intended, of Sailor Moon as unicorns. <laughs> but they were just unicorns. It was great. Um, I actually, I have like, I had like a cool trio of three, like they were more superhero-esque, um, but one girl 
had like a semi sentient arrow that she could like Ooh. ride like a skateboard. Oh, that's um, cool. cool. Yeah, that's I still awesome. think about her a lot. Like I'm like, that's a cool farmer. Wow. I wanna I wanna go back into that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I had a blatant Sailor Saturn ripoff with, like, you know, a blade that was double-ended. <laughs> but, like, your, your idea is cool. But, like, yeah. Saturn. So, all right. Okay, so now we're going to, we have, we're about to reach uh, 45 minutes. So I think we have about five minutes, uh, five to seven, ten minutes. All right, ten minutes for audience questions. So uh, let's start on this side. Hi. Um, is, any, anyway, we can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, as people who are raised on, like, Sailor Moon, Cardcaptor Sakura, occasionally Tokyo Mew Mew, um, what do you think of, like, the darker, the, like, especially modern, like, Madoka Magica, like Madoka. sort of grittier reconstructions of the magical girl genre, personally? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. Panelists? Um, I personally like it. Uh, I really enjoyed Madoka when it first came out. I'm starting to get a little tired now because they keep <laughs> making movies. But um, I love it. I remember I was really into Cutie Honey when I was younger too, which mm -hmm. was a lot darker and everything. So like, I'm okay with it. It's fun, but I do like happy things sometimes too. So <laughs> I like Madoka Magica a lot, but you can't really view it from like a Western feminist perspective because it's not meant to be like a western mm -hmm. feminist thing but i mean like you can certainly read it that way and if you choose to read it that way that's great but i really liked it i thought like aesthetically it's beautiful yeah i love those those witches are oh, way cool yeah <laughs> um i like madoka magica i think i wouldn't want to ignore the genuine dark emotional moments in works like sailor moon like there's a lot happens to those to those ladies um, <laughs> so i think it's easy to to only think about brightness and the cuteness and the happiness and the oh no like the nail polish salon is a terrible monster today but also like <laughs> they struggle with a lot of real problems um so i think that's what i think there's some there, there. there's some darkness back there too um i really enjoyed madoka i think um you know i, I like the idea that you know taking on all of this responsibility mm -hmm. can really result in internal, you know, a lot of internal baggage that you have to deal with. Um, like Wendy said, there's a lot of other things behind the show that, you know, now, like looking back on it now that I think about that paired with it. Um, but I think having both options is mm -hmm. good. You know, you have like the more, you know, glittery magic girls and then also having a darker version and then even having like a blend. So, you know, a lot of young girls can just pick and choose, mm -hmm. you know, what they like from each thing and kind of have, like, the most available to them. Right. I will inject my opinion uh, into <laughs> this one. But, um, yeah, I also enjoyed Madoka Magica a lot, actually. Um, I know we joke about dark and gritty, like, you know, uh, genre uh, subversions a lot, but um, I think that for the magical girl uh, genre, it made sense to go that way. And the thing about Madoka Magica is that it wasn't dark and gritty for the sake of shock value. Um, it had very mature themes and like, um, you know, like questions that are really um, dark and but necessary sometimes to think about, particularly through adolescence. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the big difference is that is that, you know, you don't even know that it's a dark show until the fourth episode, like when you're a third way through. Yeah, yeah. so it's like, you, there's a reason for that build up. And it's not just like, oh yeah, they transform and then heads are rolling. Ha ha. Like, <laughs> that's <laughs> like, but anyway, so I mean, like, <laughs> like if you were 14 and you wis and you witnessed something like as incredibly traumatic as like a friend dying while you were still while you were also part of this institution, but then like seeing like two guys on a train, like that scene where there's two right. guys on a train like being really gross like that mm -hmm. would totally push someone over the edge like right. that made yeah. sense to me that's a really yeah. good scene yeah. Yeah. yeah and for me it's like you know i think that the young girl's crime was not like it's not a crime to be idealistic mm -hmm. and i think that you know it really kind of showed the trauma of like when your <laughs> ideals and when your like you know um beliefs are so shaken up by reality so yeah anyways next question if, if oh Hi. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, apologies, like we will 
moment to get back to you. But panelists, please answer this awesome question. Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> you'd think I'd know this by now. Um, uh, we'll go with something, some kind of sparkly power. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Generate sparkles. Yeah. Yeah. Jubilee yeah. style. We'll I yeah. want to be, be a living <laughs> line camera. <laughs> That would be amazing. And Shauna, you should totally draw that. Yeah. <laughs> what would your power be, Wendy? Um, I am, I would just like to be able to fly on a broom. That's like all I've ever wanted oh, to do God. in my life. <laughs> it's like sometimes when I have dreams, I dream about that a lot. I would like to turn into animals. <laughs> that's all I got. Yeah. Um, I always think about, like, I want to make barriers. I, I really oh, like no. the idea of, like, offensive and de defensive, mm -hmm. and especially like, for protecting, like, just barriers that come up from the ground, and you can also shoot them at things. It's yeah. like, that's good. That's yeah. That's the power. I probably want to turn into animals, too, especially <laughs> a cat, and then I bum free food off of everyone, and people would still think I'm cute. So. <laughs> All righty. Uh, any other audience questions? Last question. All righty. Um, when you think magical girl genres, do you usually think like girls with magical powers or like girls who just live in a magical world? Oh, that's mm. a good question. Um, I would say a little of both because it's not always, like you don't have to be like a girl that transforms into something to be magical, because obviously you have magical witches, mm -hmm. and those witches could live in a magical world, and it still be like, I think it would still fall under that. I think um, s strictly adhering to the magical girl genre, you have to have some sort of power, but you don't have to have power in like all the areas. You know, Card Captor mm -hmm. Sakura doesn't transform. She has a magic wand, but like her friend makes all her outfits. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good combo. Um, yeah, I think. I guess the strictest definition, like Wendy said, is you have to be a girl who is magical, but I'm interested too in stories like, um, oh, there's so many good web comics out there that deal with <laughs> girls and magic, uh, present <laughs> company included. Um, Witchy um, is really good by Ariel Reese, and it's about a girl who loses her magical abilities in a world full of people with magic and how she deals with that. It's good. Yeah. I think my first thought is girls who have powers, but I think also exploring like you know, a girl living in a magical world mm -hmm. is also like extremely interesting. Yeah. But like my first thought for the magical girl genre is definitely girls with powers. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you panelists for all your thoughtful uh, answers and uh, discussion.